Audiences hate bad writing, not strong women by Master Samwise. She-Hulk, Peter Pan and Wendy, The Rings of Power, Captain Marvel, The Last Jedi, Mulan. All products featuring a female lead of significant strength or power, all brutally panned by audiences. Why is that? Sexism, right? No. Or maybe it's just bad character writing. That's not to discount the awfulness of any actual hatred of female characters due to their gender, but it's quite apparent once you think about it that such hateful commentary only finds any significant audience if the wider, less spiteful viewing public dislikes the character for their own, more sensible mm -hmm. reasons. The main reason, of course, is that so many lead women in film and TV in the past decade are just horribly written. Yes. There are plenty of exceptions, of course, and we'll talk about a few of those. This is a problem most notable in Disney projects, as you could tell from my list, but since Disney owns half the world yeah. at this point, it feels like a wider issue. So what exactly makes these characters such bad examples of what a protagonist should be? Well, it's hard to point to any one thing in mm -hmm. particular. Not all the characters discussed here will share the same writing flaws. They all fail in varying ways, but they do have some similarities. Mm -hmm. A common one is being overpowered and not really earning that power. The original I mean, realistically, we do complain about that with certain male characters as well. I know, for instance, those of you that know uh, about Naruto, Madara Uchiha, I, I nickname him Deus Ex Madara for a number of reasons, not limited to knowing the reverse seals to the Edo Tensei, the Edo Tensei Kai, being able to use his uh, Susano without his Sharingan after he got revived with the Ghetto uh, Ghetto Wat Renner Rebirth, number uh, Limbo, a number of things that, in my opinion, are Deus Ex Madara. And Madara, to me, never really felt like he had that power because he was supposed to rival Hashirama. And yes, he did do a lot of his own personal training with her, a lot of personal trauma because it was the Warring States era, but... I mean, outside of me saying that his Mangekyo gave him effectively a massive physical amp, he is one of those characters that the power level, to me at least, does not match the character. And a lot of people are going to point to in this video even, right? You have uh, Daisy Ridley's character, Ray. I think that Daisy Ridley got, unfortunately, backblasted way too hard when the issue is the writing in itself. That's not necessarily fair to pin on the actors when the actors have minimal, if any, impact on the script. Ray's character hit oddly for a lot of people because of the pacing at which the story went. And even then, the pacing of the story didn't really have any time to have any sort of training arc or build up that, say, Mark Hamill's Luke Skywalker did in episode four, episode five, and episode six, right? Where we have episode four and she's able to crack back into Ben's mind. And, uh, ep sorry, episode seven, episode eight, you have, um, the whole throne room scene, which they're able to fight perfectly together, which gets kind of fallen under that forced dyad umbrella because forced dyad. Um, and then you have episode nine where just, you know, some nutty things are happening, being able to pull the uh, the alleged ship with Chewbacca on it. Right. And being able to pull that down, you know, kind of Starkiller esque in a way. But uh, being just th there's a number of things there that didn't quite add up to a lot of audiences. And there were a couple things about the films that just I, I like the sequels, don't get me wrong, but there were a couple things about them that I just really kind of scratched my head at. The biggest one was the forced romance subplot. I actually kind of and I mean this quite literally cringed in the theater. I kind of recoiled. I, I think that that was way too ham fisted. Personally, you don't a strong female character does not have to have a love interest. A strong female character does not have to get with another strong male character. They can be a incredibly strong and complete character on their own. If you want to have some kind of organic romantic subplot open up, that's perfectly fine. But it's the way that the writing is and the speed and pacing and the delivery that for me at the very least really come under fire. Animated film shows Mulan's struggle due to her inexperience and lack of physical right. prowess. But she makes up for those disadvantages by using her wits, thinking creatively, and refusing to quit even when things seem hopeless. The new Mulan is basically a superhero already due to her midichlorians, and thus is automatically more skilled than everyone else. You There's see no where the disconnect is in this, though? You see how each of these has a different pacing and tonal effect, right? Imagine, like, we're going back to Naruto really quick, right? So in Naruto, right, if N Naruto had to spend how much time training just to be able to do a Rasengan? Has spent how, how much time training to be able to master Sage Mode, to be able to use the Rasen Shuriken, right? And then you have 
I don't know, Madara out of nowhere that just kind of craps out a perfect Susano or just summons meteors. And yeah, yeah, plot convenience, you could argue. Or you have something like, you know, people about Boruto, where Boruto doesn't ever really have to work for his powers, doesn't really have to work to the same degree. And that in itself gets into another storytelling element where we could be seeing the reverse of Naruto, where Naruto came from nothing, had to build up to everything, and Boruto could be, have everything and, you know, got uh, built down to nothing, right? We could be seeing an inverse of that. But that being said, as the series isn't finished, I don't really want to comment on that further. But there is a tonal shift where somebody had to work for their power. Somebody had to go through... Dagobah, go through the cave on Dagobah and be able to face Darth Vader and not even be in the same league as Vader. That episode five fight was an absolute one-sided just massacre on Invader's favor. And then, which is impressive seeing how Luke goes to six, right? We got to see that where Ray kind of fought par with Ben Solo, with Kylo Ren. In, ep- in episode seven. And there was that part where she connected with the force and then was able to absolutely just cream him. But realistically, right out the gate, you know, it was kind of a, well, I guess you already are established at having this power level, I guess. Uh, and then episode eight, it goes into the throne room scene, which is consistently criticized for having that one kukri that disappears because technically that would have been a game ending situation. I guess we'll fix it in post. And, you know, then being able to go toe to toe with Palpatine to a degree, just uh, I, you, you can see where there's different tone tones and pacing in regards to the sequel trilogy need for her to use her brain or develop new ways to approach problems, leaving the character flat and uninteresting. It's worth noting that when I say earning power, that doesn't necessarily mean doing something noble or virtuous that results in the character being given great power, as is the case with someone like Captain America. Please. Most superheroes do not earn their abilities in such a way. Their powers are forced upon them through chance or freak accident, and that's fine. However, to then earn the power given them, the hero should have to struggle in some way to grow into his or her abilities. The Tobey Maguire Spider-Man movie is a classic example of this. Peter Parker is given superpowers through a random spider bite, but he doesn't instantly know what to do with his newfound abilities, nor even how to put them to proper use. There are significant growing pains as he learns to be the hero he now must become. A more recent example of this trope that was done fairly well is Kate Bishop from The Hawkeye Show that at least 20 people watched. (laughs) Despite being an incredibly talented archer and martial artist from the get-go, Kate is woefully inexperienced in the world of crime fighting and has to learn how to apply her skills in each new situation, relying on the mentorship of Hawkeye himself. On the flip side, we have characters like She-Hulk and Rey Sky Patine. Sky Patine. Rey's progression through her Jedi training was basically just whatever the plot required at any given moment. Jen Walters woke up as She-Hulk and immediately was in full control of her alter ego. The central struggles that defined the characters from whom these heroines were derived are just stripped away and not replaced by anything meaningful. So here's the thing with that, though. I haven't seen She-Hulk, so this is just a base, blind kind of take on this, right? It's an interesting and almost um, antithetical was not what I was going for, but it's it's contrary to the Hulk who do- who didn't have control, right? going into someone who has immediate control. There is absolutely cool plot things you can do with that, right? Where the Hulk had to come into, uh, uh, come to try and, you know, deal with the Hulk in his own ways. Excuse Professor Ben tried to deal with the Hulk in his own ways and try to restrict it where possible and having to come to terms with becoming the Hulk. There's a number of things there that add to his story arc where, you know, Gratz, I just woke up and I'm in full control of this if executed poorly or incorrectly leads into a very flat character leads into a very just kind of and eh? you, you've built nothing on the audience right darth vader has an impact on the audience because he literally when men it was called star wars not star wars episode four new hope when it was called star wars what was one of the first scenes vader walking in and the the, the breathing right a, a sense of just ominous forebodings and power and authority walking into the opening scenes, right? And you don't really have that. You you're, you have not impressed anything on your audience if you just kind of wake up one day and grats, we're just She-Hulk now. What what have you impressed? What, what has led your audience to care about a character? Nothing? Well, I mean, that's your problem. You've done nothing to give your audience incentive, right? If I were to make a video, right, and I were to spend the first 30 minutes of a video ranting, kind of like I'm doing right now, (laughs) what incentive have I given for people to care? What do I have that people want to watch? 
with movies or with fiction books, why do you care about Aragorn? It's is it because he is this uh, the the royalty from Arnor and he's the only one that can write, unite the kingdoms of Arnor and Gondor because he's the last of the bloodline, you know? Or is it that uh, you know you care about him because you get to see him as a character? He already has a lot of these skills. He was the head of the Dunedain, the chieftain of the Dunedain, right? At least the Arnorian Dunedain, and you get to see how healthy he is as a man, and you know the fact that he's you know willing to be jovial and carefree and easygoing but he's also able to buckle down and he's able to be fierce and he's able to you know back his words with actions you know when boromir trying to get the ring when they were uh, climbing up kahadras right in the films and it's the scene where he goes i care not and then sean bean as boromir walks away and you see aragorn he had gripped his sword right he would he'd be willing to do what he could to protect frodo in that instance that builds rapport with your audience and therefore makes us care. I'm not saying you can't do a She-Hulk, but you have to execute it correctly in a way that makes your audience care. Jen's defining character moment takes place during a group therapy session when she comes to the realization that she needs to accept that she doesn't need to be She-Hulk to find acceptance. That's right, the apex of Jen's character arc is her deciding that she can be herself. Okay. This wasn't an issue, by the way, until after the She-Hulk persona was present. Prior to her accident, Jen appeared to be quite satisfied with her life. For some unknown reason, she only decided to get into the dating scene after spending some time as a giant green uh -huh. monster, and then found out apparently there's no market for a reasonably attractive 30-something-year-old lawyer in Los Angeles. So, hear me out. I could see a logical reason behind this if you wanted, if you wanted me to actually dig into a character arc where... The concept of you don't know how you don't know what you have till it's gone, right? Where, for for instance, right? Oh yeah, I haven't left my house in a week, and suddenly you get sick, and you're like, "Damn, I want to go outside. Damn, I want to go to the studio. I want to go to the store. Oh, I want to go look for video games and stuff." And you want to get out, but you only want to do it because what you could have done is no longer accessible. You don't know what you have until it's gone. I could see that being a thing, and thus coming to a realization that you know, well, I'm a busybody, and there just isn't a market for this. You know, I'm not some twenty something year old with a only OF oh, uh, fansly anything like that and you know there's a whole array of reasons where you could come to this realization that maybe I'm not as I mean that that's not this hot shot like I thought I was right having a big career having like, as a legal right having a big career being successful not having to necessarily worry about money and making ends meet and then kind of coming to that realization that there's just not a market for this there's not a market for me I can see being a very interesting character arc once again, if handled correctly. And it seems like this was kind of ham fisted. And at that point, is that necessarily on the actors? I would argue, no, I think that's on writing and poor quality writing. There's no shortage of stories that have strong female characters that have strong non-binary characters that have strong characters that are from all walks of life right and see in, in, in uh considering uh fantasy right all walks of faith too you could have someone that follows uh what is it corn from uh the chaos god from Forham or on 40k or they maybe are a follower of tiamat or bahamut and dungeons and dragons right any any number of these and you can have cool stories. It's characterizing somebody, knowing where they're at and what struggles they're facing and what struggles they must overcome to progress without giving any spoilers. It's why I actually like Xenos's uh, revelation, Xenos actually showing up in our first fight with him in Final Fantasy XIV Stormblood. And I looked at that as a K. I know what this is trying to do and I know what this is trying to set up and I like it because he's an intriguing character to me already. And it's just knowing what something is trying to do or trying to dissect it that can be an issue. And even then, you could dissect something. You can know what it's trying to do, but it could, at the end of the day, ultimately just be boring. I don't know about you, but to me, that feels a bit contrived. Look, I'm not in the online dating scene, but I have it on good authority that women tend to get significantly more attention than men do on yeah. those apps, especially if they happen to be successful and not ugly. Does this show seriously expect me to believe that the only guys willing to even talk to Jen Walters are total creeps and losers, or alternatively, men who are only charming and friendly because they have an agenda? <laughs> Speaking of which, let's talk about Disney's obsession. <laughs> they, with they can't just be an adorable uh, golden retriever boy 
in a basement playing MMOs and FPS games all day. No, none of that. And I mean, I, I guess there could be a commentary on that in regard to the type of men that she was going after, because obviously matching is a process, right? You don't have to go with every match that you have, and you know you're trying to gravitate towards certain archetypes of people. You could make an argument for that, and then a further character uh, study and dissect a character in regards to the type of men that they're choosing, the type of partners that they're choosing to match with. Promoting and elevating women. It's one thing to have female characters who are smart, strong, persistent, and yes. courageous. It's quite another to simply promote the power of women by setting them up on a pedestal. That kind of treatment is nothing more than pandering, and stories that contain it suffer greatly. Take, for example, the recent Peter Pan and Never Wendy, it. which decided that the all-male cast of Lost Boys wasn't inclusive enough, and so tossed some girls into the mix. Girls can be rough and tumble too, you hear? Uh, do you know why the Lost Boys were originally- I don't know, I don't get that logic. I mean, like... <sighs> Give me a second, I'm gonna like, actually dissect and unpack this. So, like, it's one thing if you look at, like, Disney's Song of the South, right? If you know what I'm talking about, you know. And maybe having to change up some art styles because, you know, very valid reasons, right? I can And I, I can see something like that. I can see something along the lines of, uh, you know, Mr. Popo garnering outrage for obvious reasons or Jinx garnering outrage for obvious reasons, right? I can see things like that and the need to change things for that for and i'm very curious on this explanation that's about to happen but for the lost boys which as far as i'm aware have always been just that lost boys to add a female element to that i i'm very curious into the reasoning as of this like there's certain things that get changed that not I'm not necessarily getting a torch and a pitchfork. I and I don't think a lot of people are either. I think the question that immediately comes to mind is why? Why did you make this change? Why do you think that this was a valid change? Why did you think that this could exist? And there's absolutely changes that can go and be better and be in mind with current canon. You know, I'm not saying that retcons and uh, being able to go back and change your story is a bad thing. I mean, all artists do it. All writers do it. For crying out loud, we ha do you know what the two blue wizards are called from uh, Lord, uh, Lord of the Rings? Tolkien's, Tolkien's Compendium, the uh, the Silmarillion. You know what the two blue wizards are called? Some people are going to answer. Oh, of course, it's Alatar and Palando, right? Uh, that's one of their names. The, there's another thing. And do you know when they came to Middle Earth? Oh, they came into Middle Earth at the uh, 1503rd age, right? Uh, no, actually, older writings didn't they come at the end of the Second Age and actually fight in the War, uh, War, uh, War of the Last Alliance, right? And uh, how many Balrogs were there in Lord of the Rings, right? Oh, well, there's no fewer than three and no more than seven, right? Well, yes, by Tolkien's later writings, but did you know that in older writings, there were hundreds, if not thousands, of Balrogs? And that's not to say you can't go back and retcon your work or change your work or clarify something or something doesn't make sense in the universe as it expands and you go ahead and change it, right? A lot of people in Star Wars, I talk about Waru and the uh, Crystal Star a lot. A lot of Star Wars fans apparently did not like Waru and the Crystal Star. Um, but it's one of those things that you just look at and you go, but why was this necessary? Why was the Balrog change necessary? Maybe because Balrogs are literally OP and they're fallen Maiar. You know, Maiar like Sauron and Gandalf and Saruman. I almost said Kuromo. I, I actually remember their, their Maiar names more than I do their Astari names, which is wild to me. You know, why would you go back and uh, change certain things about the Star Wars Legendarium? Well, it's because they didn't want to go the Abeloth route or they considered tertiary canon like certain novels and stuff that just they weren't in line with their current canon and they wanted the ability to do things over. It's I'm not faulting the ability for retcons. They have to make sense and they have they just have to be logical, if that makes sense. Oh, boys. It's because they fell out of their prams, or strollers for you right. Americans, and were carted off to Neverland. And oh, girls are no. far too clever to do such a stupid thing. But apparently no one involved in the casting decision had ever read the original novel, so here we are. I don't really know where to stand on that. Because there's, there's, I have people that I know that I could talk to, and I can get both sides of that argument thrown at me. And I think there's grains of validity in each side at the end of the day there's also inherent danger in well that's not canon and you know you know this this shouldn't be right because i mean there's people that are going to tell me outright kip force unleashed isn't canon I, I i i had canon force unleashed apparently it's canon on the wiki i've heard all i've heard 
uh, other accounts that it is no longer considered canon and has never really been canon because of how it takes place. And I'd be a hypocrite to say that, you know, can, can anonymity be damned, honestly? It comes down to, does it make sense? Is it respectful of the source material? And if it's not going to be respectful of the source material, why are you not naming it something different? Why is it not a inspired by rather than an adaptation? Because that does exist. Or we could talk about Captain Marvel and the thinly veiled metaphor for the patriarchy embodied in the one dude who keeps telling her to not use her true power because that's cheating or whatever. What? And of course, She-Hulk seems to be mostly made just to complain about the pig-headedness of okay. men. It's a hot chick over there. I'm going to go talk to it. Yeah, nobody talks like that. It should come as no surprise. No, some Twitter users talk like that. That's the problem. Those movies don't just fail at writing good female characters. They're terribly written across the board. I'm the spy. What? It's not. Just I actually Ray, liked Hux though. I liked Hux strictly because it was the enemy, my enemy. It's not that Hux was the good guy. It's that I don't. I don't care if you win. I just want to see Kylo Ren lose. I thought that was brilliant personally, because it's like it brings in that ambiguous nature that sometimes your theater audience isn't quite going to catch. It depends. Like, did you play Modern Warfare 2 from 2009? Do you remember what happened with Shadow Company and General Shepard, right? The enemy, my enemy. <laughs> and stuff like that. I, I always have had this appreciation for good works and good writing and being able to, uh, you know, have these kind of gray interactions with each other. It's not that he was a good guy, even though I feel that people kind of like thought that he was. It's like, no. He just wants to see someone else lose. It is literally the enemy of my enemy. Was it maybe ham-fisted? A little bit. And, you know, he kind of got ganked by uh, the other uh, general that came on in, right? But And that kind of wrapped up fairly quickly. But I thought it was a neat touch. Maybe it could use a little more polish and refinement, honestly. But I thought it was a decent twist. The audience dislikes. No characters from the Disney trilogy won the hearts of the audience. Remember how great of a character Nick Fury was in Captain Marvel? Yeah, neither does anyone else. Elrond really stood out in the Rings of Power, right? Okay, he actually wasn't terrible. He wasn't good, but he could have been worse. Honestly, Galadriel could have been worse too. Not that I think she was well-written. She wasn't. And her introduction in the first episode is basically a how-to course on annoying audiences. We first meet her as she's being tormented by other elf children for having the audacity to think that her origami swan will float. Not only does this display a severe lack of understanding Wait. of what elves are in Wait. Tolkien's legend. That can't be Elrond. There's no way. Not only does this display a severe lack of understanding of what elves are in Tolkien's Where did... Where did... Because he fought in Caligon the Black on the stupid Valar skyship, his father... That's the light of Arendelle is actually his father holding up a Silmaril in the head. Why Tolkien extended lore gets weird. I'm telling you. Oh my God. It gets so weird. Yeah. The light of Arendelle, the file that Frodo has that Gladio gifts to him is literally like the light of, from the Silmaril that is held by Elrond's father up in the heavens on a boat that flies. Oh my God. It's a trip. It's so good. I love Tolkien lore. No, like I'm trying to figure out when that takes place because like, is that Feanor? That can't be Feanor. I don't know. I have to watch Rings of Power. This is this is blowing my mind with how they're setting up certain things because I don't know if this is before or after the death of the two trees, and I'm pretty sure that after the death of the two trees, you get into the whole kinslaying incident, and you get into Feanor uh, going over the sea, and the rest of the elves having to come over to Middle or uh, rest of the Noldorim that were part of. Thanor's thing, and that, that's actually why there was the whole redemption arc, and I will return to the West and remain Galadriel in Lord of the Rings films, because that is Galadriel literally being able to finally return West, return to the Undying Lands. There's a whole thing to unpack there, but like, God, I don't know, it's just so weird. Once again, getting back to established lore, and if you're going to contradict established lore, or throw it out the window, or modify it in certain ways, right? Like, why not just say inspired by and make a new series? The answer is money. The answer is, oh, hey, it's money can sell. I re Although I do remember a time when 
the Tolkien estate and Lord of the Rings and Middle Earth as a brand did feel a lot less doled out. Like obviously we had things like Lord of the Rings, the uh, the the Third Age, right? For or Fellowship of the Ring for the GBA, right? But we also got stuff like Battle for Middle Earth One and Battle for Middle Earth Two, which are some of the best RTS. I'm I'm, I'm not bad. I'm bad at RP. I'm, I'm super bad at RTSs. They are such good games though. If you've never played Battle for Middle Earth, do yourself a favor and play them. Like it's just so strange to watch, and it's uh, it's upsetting because. The writing just isn't there. Then again, they're not Tolkien. They don't understand the world necessarily that he does or the way that his son does, right? But the fact that the writing just isn't there. Do I expect everyone to be able to sit through a, you know, an entire lecture on the Dago Dagoroth and is Dago Dag- and is the Dago Dagoroth when Melkor is supposed to return to Arda? Is that necessarily canon or not canon? I'm not necessarily expecting people to be able to know the deep lore about Tolkien's The New Shadow, which was supposed to be the sequel to Lord of the Rings, but 14 pages in, it would have been more of a horror novel. Tolkien decided it wasn't the story he wanted to write, and therefore we get what we get as after Lord of the Rings came after that. It's it, I don't expect people to be able to sit through some of the deep lore, right? I don't. Like, what are the Silmarils? You saw. You need to know that there were some some Feanor made some jewels and uh, some stuff happened to your average to your average viewer. Right? I think we can all agree on that. I don't think that you necessarily need to expect everyone to be on there, but it when it just contrasts per- early perceptions so much, or what you receive just isn't delivered. I mean, I think as an audience, you have a right to just go. This wasn't what I was expecting. Why did this happen in this way? Tolkien's Legendarium on the writer's part, it demonstrates a cheap trick that modern media likes to use in order to attempt to make the audience like a character. Forced sympathy. The mantra goes something like this. Look, this character is being mistreated. You must then feel bad for her and like her. The correct response to that is, of course, why is this character being mistreated? For all we know, Galadriel was being a complete twerp just moments before this scene and is totally deserving of having her boat sunk. There's no narrative reason that the show gives for Galadriel to be tormented here. It's just an attempt at manipulating the audience into feeling bad for the poor, helpless victim and thus hopefully liking her. Contrast that with Arcane and the plight of Vin and Powder. The show opens with an actually tragic scene, and it doesn't stoop to the pointed, petty tactics of Rings of Power. Galadriel lives in Valinor, a place of transcendent peace and harmony, so the writers contrived an inane attempt at sympathy. Arcane is set largely in a brutal slum of a city, but it gives its main character a plucky, relentless attitude that rejects the victimhood status which so many other modern properties confer upon their heroines. Because if you're a victim... Well, you also just... I feel you kind of disconnect with certain audiences. Like, for example, if you have something like... Like we just saw, no new matches, right? As a guy... How many times you've been on Tinder, Facebook dating, etc. And that's just, yeah, no, that makes sense. That's just average. It might not be average for women. I don't know. I can't speak to the women in NB communities. I really can't. What I can say is sometimes you kind of alienate your audience. And while there's that understanding of just like, oh, well, she's undesirable. She's having dating issues. She's having trouble with, you know, coming to terms with herself and the predicament that she's in. While there can be that understanding, sometimes there's just things that are just like, who cares? Why, why should I care when other series like Lord of the Rings do it so well where you have, uh, you know, things like the, the, the paths of the dead and the oath breakers, right? Why should you care? Oh, this makes sense. Yeah. Maybe not break your promise and maybe not, you know, like say you'll do something, but not do the other thing because that in itself is just morally wrong and not necessarily become a spooky ghost or a wraith, right? But just that it's that you shouldn't do it. It's generally regarded as bad. How can anyone hate you? Well, it's pretty easy when you're incredibly smug and don't give a rat's ass about the safety of your troops. The me against the world vibes from Galadriel in the first episode are just so tired and overdone. We know she's going to be right about Sauron still being around because of course she is. She can take down the ice troll single-handedly because of course she can. However, That on its own would not necessarily be bad writing. Gladriel, because that is what the show calls her, is quite old and thus an experienced warrior. I'm willing to accept that this character has spent centuries in combat and thus is highly skilled and capable of such I mean, realistically, the the people that kind of complain about that did Legolas, the backwater hillbilly hick of an elf. Yes, I absolutely love him. (laughs) Did he not in the films, the cinematic variant, if we're comparing cinema, right? the, The movies... Did he not take down an entire Mumma kill to the that still only counts as one response, right? 
this, especially with elves or fey creatures, does not necessarily necessitate bad writing. It doesn't. Like they're old, they're 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 skilled. They've honed their craft and honed their skills through years and years and years and decades and decades and centuries and centuries. Right? Elves and Tolkien are old. Just like th- this makes sense. It's the delivery that could come across as disingenuous, or the delivery that can come across as flat. What makes this scene so absurd is that all the other elves around her, these warriors hand-picked to exterminate Sauron and the remnants of his armies, are completely and totally hapless and helpless to the point that they might as well be a different species than their leader. It's totally fine to have protagonists who are supremely skilled, but it's a really poor choice to have the supporting characters be complete buffoons yeah. in order to showcase that At skill. that point, you're just chaff. Why are you there? Why, why, and if anything, it even calls into the question, the... Uh, the how how good Galadriel would be at making decisions in regards to who's good for an operation, who's not good for an operation. That could also be a plot point that comes from it, where you know, well, we know what happened to your men, and we know that you're not necessarily the best with finding soldiers. Wink, wink, right? And you, you could use that as a plot point down the line. But if it's not addressed, and it's just like, hey, you're here just to showcase the troll is this big bad, and that it's you know ganking all the party members, and it's up to Galadriel to let me solo it, right? I mean, you can see how that comes as a cop-out to a lot of people. Galadriel might as well just be out there on her own. Really, most of the examples I've listed tend to just do things solo. It is up to them and them alone to win the day. As in Captain Marvel and Mulan, all they really need to do is seize the power that is already within them to throw off the shackles others would impose upon them, and victory is theirs. The dramatic shift between victimhood and total power is what these movies believe to be meaningful character work, but it's really just a violent swing from one extreme to the other, and neither end of the spectrum is healthy. There's a huge difference between having agency and being world-conquering forces of nature that only needed to shrug off the hands holding them down. If you're going to write the hero of a story, a central character who ultimately is able to conquer the evil he or she faces, you need to make them earn it. That protagonist needs to struggle or even suffer as they obtain the strength necessary to win the day. Ideally, they would find such strength through meaningful relationships or by learning from those wiser or more experienced than them. Recent examples of this done at least fairly well, Rita Vertasky, a supremely skilled soldier having to work together with Tom Cruise's character, whose name I forget, to gradually establish a plan to win the war. Vi being motivated by love for her sister, relying on others in her fight, badly missing the guidance of her father figure. Kate Bishop being mentored by Hawkeye as she realizes how ill-prepared she is for the world she has stumbled into. There are plenty of other examples of female protagonists who match that description, but I wanted to point out some from within the last decade to emphasize the point that audiences do not, by and large, just hate any strong woman on screen right now, just the ones whose character arcs are flatter than the state of Kansas. Characters who need only achieve self-actualization are not only boring and lack meaningful character work, they teach us awful lessons. The idea that all that is needed for success is to seize the strength and power already within you is a harmful notion that discredits the value of relationships, personal growth, and humility. You are sufficient, these stories tell their audiences. You don't need to change. Our heroes are supposed to inspire us, either by their ability to grow beyond their own flaws and failures, or, despite being paragons of virtue and goodness, still having to struggle against overwhelming odds and having to use their wits to be creative, to trust their team to win the day. Indeed, some of the most admirable characters in fiction, ones who do not suffer all that much personal growth due to having already attained great virtue, find themselves insufficient. This is most clear in Tolkien's Mm -hmm. work, where characters such as Faramir, Theoden, and Aragorn, great men who suffer little, if any, inner turmoil, at least in the books, are not able to win the day, but rather can only play their part in the war that will define the future of Middle-earth. Right, and then there's also other conversations to be had, especially in the books, where technically it is heavily theorized, if not confirmed, that Eru Iluvatar's own intervention, Cat, please, own intervention, uh was what made Frodo speak out, or at least it's heavily implied that Eru Luvatar was the one that did that, because the the movies and books do a lot of different things, if that makes sense. And that's, one is not necessarily inherently better than the other, and in fact, I view them both as complementary of each other, and there are reasons to read the books, and there are reasons to watch the movies. We are more... Con- it, it really does come down to that, like, 
even in the movies, they they don't have the ability. It's established in the movies. They don't have the strength to be able to overcome the uh, the, the the ring, the, the influence of the ring, the pull of the ring, and that pull of absolute power. And that is a plot point that's impressed, and therefore it kind of covers for the book going into them a lot less, and we got more of them in the movie, so it kind of evens out a little bit. But that's a very good observation. They teach us the message we need to hear, the message that Disney and Hollywood want to keep from our ears. And that is, you are not enough, but you still can do great things. They may not bring you glory. They may even bring you pain and suffering. But if you put the good of others before your own needs and wants, you will find true and lasting happiness. So many modern heroines fail to win the love of the audience because they take shortcuts to power. They are elevated by the story rather than having to climb up their own character arc. They are shallow character molds created largely to prove a point or push an agenda. And perhaps most importantly, they tend to care for themselves, their own success, their own ideas of what it means to be fulfilled. Hollywood and Disney in particular seem to want so badly to provide us with examples of powerful women, but they fail to understand what makes for a good example or role model. The heroines they prop up are too often shallow, unlikable, and exhibit many of the traits, such as arrogance and abrasiveness, that their creators find abhorrent in male protagonists. Yeah. How is this fixed? Simple. Create characters to tell a story, not to prove a point. Either show flawed characters who have to grow and change to heal their inner wounds and overcome their shortcomings, or give us paragons of virtue who have to struggle, sacrifice, and suffer due to the evil they face. But most importantly, write characters whose defining moments do not come as they realize their own worth and value, that they themselves are sufficient, but rather as they decide to take selfless action for the good of others. I can't carry it for you, but I can carry you! Well, those are all my rambling thoughts on the matter. I hope we see lots more characters like Vi, Kim Wexler, Rita Vertasky, and Evelyn from the Quiet Place movies. I just realized two of those characters are played by Emily Blunt. No surprise there, considering her publicly stated thoughts on the strong female lead trope. Anyhow, let me know your thoughts and opinions, and I will see you in the next one. Thank you so much for watching. No, this is great. I absolutely love this. If you haven't checked out Master Samwise, go ahead and check them out. I want to make sure that cool creators like this I, as a React channel can add commentary and kind of just funnel people their way as well. I want to make sure that you know good creators are getting noticed. I want to make sure that good creators are uh, you know, being found in the algorithm that people can find new awesome people to watch. Yes, Kat, I hear you. I hear you. You've been screaming this whole time. How are you doing? Don't you meow at me. Meow, 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 meow. That's what I thought. <laughs> let the cat out after this i did she was asleep in like my corner but uh what are your thoughts on this do you think that this is necessarily off base do you think that this is accurate do you think that uh it really you agree with the notion that it is a writing issue that it's not necessarily that you have actor actresses like daisy ridley that you have you know these these actors and actresses that are playing these roles but it's that they're be being given scripts that just aren't good or they're being provided with art that and writing that is just subpar and maybe i'm spoiled maybe i'm spoiled because i did read things like tolkien i did read things like wheel of time i did read things like christopher powell and his aragon series you know maybe i just have and I've, I've also had a lot of uh good media that i've consumed good media in regards to anime being things like code geos gundam double o um you know, a bunch of things like that. So maybe I'm just spoiled and uh, maybe I just have a refined palette. I don't think I necessarily do, but I can't really dismiss it. So let me know if, what your thoughts are on that. And I really do think that just, I want to impress, don't harass any of the actors or actresses. At the end of the day, they are given a role. Unless it's something like some weird situation like Amber Heard that becomes a whole debacle and it comes back to bite her because of things being proven true. That's a little different, but, you know, making fun of Daisy Ridley, you know, we saw those Hayden Christensen as well back in the sequel uh, prequels. And it's it's heartbreaking, honestly, when it's it's not their fault. It's not In fact, Hayden Christensen did an amazing job. And I will go on every sort of record and say that that man played Anakin Skywalker to the literal best of his ability. And I absolutely love him for it because that man went super hard in that role. Ewan McGregor is Obi-Wan too. God, that whole cast was amazing. And I like the cast. I thought that uh, John Boyega as Finn got incredibly just, I, I, I thought he got, he got done dirty. There could have been a lot with uh, John Boyega becoming a Jedi, but he uh, kind of got relegated to more of a background character. And that was honestly very sad because I thought John Boyega did an amazing performance. 
um, yeah, just uh, things to think about, things to think about in writing. Is it necessarily bad that people are changing things or retconning things? Is it okay that people are retconning things? Why are they retconning things? And do those reasons make sense? Just things to consider, all that fun stuff. What are your thoughts? Let me know in the comment section. Please keep it civil as always. I'm going to let this cat out and I'll see you all in the next one.